On a recent trip to Chicago, I was introduced to the 150 North Riverside Plaza. Phenomenal architecture. Normally a building's foundation is larger or of equal size to the building itself, but because of the lack of ground space in Chicago, the engineers were forced to build a tapered foundation for the building to rest upon. A little closer to home, we have the Ontario College of Art and Design with its own unique foundational design, although this one, I guess it's for aesthetic reasons. Now, regardless, the construction of the two buildings encountered a similar challenge, namely that the foundation was smaller than the building itself. We encounter a similar situation with the human knee, where the larger femur rests on the smaller tibia. And just as architects had to address this foundational issue with buildings such as these, the knee is designed to resolve this structurally unstable situation. This is the focus of this next session. Welcome back to our discussion of the joints of the lower limb. The knee presents a particular challenge as it's involving a larger bone, the femur, resting upon a smaller bone, the tibia. So as a result, there's a number of supporting soft tissue structures that attempt to reinforce the joint and provide it a greater level of structural stability. Now it also means that despite this reinforcement, the knee is one of the most common sites of mechanical injury, particularly in contact sports and activities involving frequent changes in direction. In this session, we're going to look at components of the knee joint and discuss some of the more common injuries seen at this particular joint. The knee joint is a complex articulation involving three separate bones, the femur superiorly, the tibia inferiorly, and the patella anteriorly. If you're already familiar with your lower leg anatomy, you'll notice that the fibula was excluded from this list. That's because despite being nearly as long as the tibia, the fibula is actually entirely separate from the knee joint and plays no role in weight-bearing function. This lack of structural support probably accounts for reports of athletes competing with a broken fibula. Now this would be incredibly painful, however, so don't get any ideas. The knee can actually be divided into three separate articulations. The first two involve what we traditionally think of as the knee joint between the femur and the tibia. These are the medial and lateral tibiofemoral joints. This distinction is commonly done by orthopedic surgeons to help with characterization of certain types of knee injuries. Note that this is an incomplete differentiation where the two subregions of the femorotibial articulation are separated by the intercondylar ridge of the tibia. The third articulation, the patellofemoral joint, is between the anterior articulating surface of the femur and the posterior articulating surface of the patella. Note that the articulating surfaces between the femur and tibia are rather incongruent, meaning that they don't line up quite as nicely as we saw, for example, at the sacroiliac joint. The femoral condyles take on a rounded or condyloid appearance, but when you look at the tibial condyles, they tend to be much flatter in appearance. Now, if this was the end of the story, it may lead to some complications and pressure points between the articulating surfaces. As we will see a little later on, the presence of cartilaginous discs improve the surface area contact and minimize these pressure points. Biomechanically, it seems that we get the best surface contact and stability in the extended position which is appropriate because this represents the weight-bearing position. If we expand this image out a little bit, you'll notice that the tibial shaft pretty much lies in a completely vertical position. The femoral shaft, on the other hand, runs at an oblique angle from lateral to medial as it runs inferiorly. Now, this is because of the weight distribution from the pelvis, which is initially directed laterally into the proximal region of the femur and has to be redirected medially so that when you actually look at the knee itself, it should lie pretty much directly underneath the hip joint. The overall effect is that the weight distribution from the hip lies directly over the knee to provide a vertical stability in a standing position. As a result, we sometimes talk about what's called the Q angle, which is made by drawing a vertical line straight through the tibial shaft and the tibial tuberosity and a second line from the anterior superior iliac spine to the middle of the patella. The point where the two lines intersect creates the Q angle and gives us an indication of normal anatomical alignment 
for the femoral shaft relative to the tibial shaft. This angle ranges between 10 and 15 degrees and tends to be slightly greater in women due to a slightly wider pelvic girdle. Extremes in the Q angle, either in one direction or another, are going to have clinical implications. We already discussed genu verum, also known as bow-leggedness. The femoral shaft lies closer to the vertical, and as a result, we have a decreased Q angle to approximately 5 degrees. As a result, the weight distribution from the hip now lies more over the medial condyles, resulting in greater compressive forces on this side of the knee. Consequently, there's going to be greater wear and tear on the medial femoral tibial joint. The opposite situation is called a genu valgum, where we have an excess of Q angle greater than 15 degrees. As a result, the center of weight distribution now lies directly over top of the lateral condyles of the femur and tibia, leading to increased lateral wear and tear. Either one of these situations is going to predispose an individual to osteoarthritis in later life. As stated off the top, there's an inherent instability to the knee joint due to a larger surface articulating with a smaller surface below. The knee is reinforced with a strong joint capsule with some associated reinforcing ligaments that we'll be discussing in depth. The anterior portion of the capsule fuses into the patella bilaterally, where it blends superiorly with the patellar tendon and thickens inferiorly to form the patellar ligament. As a result, the patella is continuous with the joint capsule and makes up the anterior wall of the capsule, replacing the capsular tissue. Posteriorly, the capsule is reinforced by some ligaments, which we will discuss. Here we see the internal structure of the joint capsule. Again, we see how the patella is actually incorporated into the anterior joint capsule and also see the synovial cavity, which lines all non-articulating surfaces, attaching to the bone around the perimeter of these articulating surfaces. It extends superiorly as a region known as the suprapatellar bursa. This creates some slack in the joint capsule and extension so that the joint capsule can stretch out during flexion without causing damage to the synovial membrane itself. In this axial view, we can see the attachment point of the synovial membrane around the periphery of the articulating surfaces. The synovial membrane actually runs around the cruciate ligaments, which we'll soon be discussing. So even though the cruciate ligaments are found intracapsular, they are actually extrasynovial, meaning that they are not actually found within the joint cavity itself. A number of strong ligaments help to reinforce the unstable nature of the knee joint. A series of intrinsic ligaments representing a thickening of the joint capsule surround the knee. The patellar tendon, also known as the quadriceps tendon, is a continuation of the quadriceps musculature that runs into the superior border of the patella. These fibers continue down past the patella to insert on the tibial tuberosity. Inferior to the patella, the fibers are commonly referred to as the patellar ligament, although the question of whether this is more appropriately referred to as a tendon or ligament, it's a matter of debate. As the knee is a hinge joint, we also have collateral ligaments, similar to what we saw at the elbow, to help prevent any abduction or adduction of the leg itself. First, we have the tibial collateral ligament on the medial side, which is often referred to as the medial collateral ligament, or MCL. The MCL resists valgus forces that try to abduct the leg at the knee joint. It's important to note that the inferior fibers of the MCL blend into a structure known as the medial meniscus, which we'll be discussing a little later on, and as we shall see, it has implications related to knee injuries. On the lateral side is the fibular collateral ligament, or lateral collateral ligament. This is actually an extracapsular ligament, being functionally separate from the joint capsule. Because it complements the MCL on the medial side, we include it in this discussion of the intrinsic capsular ligaments for simplicity's sake. Note the presence of a tendon for a muscle that we'll be discussing with the lower leg, the popliteus, that passes between the fibular collateral ligament and the joint capsule to attach to the head of the fibula. The LCL prevents various stresses that try to adduct the leg at the knee. Along the posterior surface is the arcuate ligament. This is a reinforcement of the joint capsule that projects over top of the popliteus muscle. 
The oblique popliteal ligament is a continuation of the tendon of semimembranosus that blends into the joint capsule. We also have a number of other structures, particularly muscle tendons, which will help to further reinforce the knee actively. We also have intercapsular ligaments that provide support to the knee. If we think back to the elbow, we had extensive contact between the bones that prevented any sort of anterior or posterior translocation. The same can't be said for the knee. To increase the anteroposterior stability here, we need something along the lines of collateral ligaments anteriorly and posteriorly to be able to prevent the shift. The problem is we still want to accommodate flexion and extension, which would be restricted by collateral ligaments. The solution lies in a set of oblique running ligaments internal to the joint capsule itself. These are the cruciate ligaments, so named because they crisscross and spiral around one another in a clockwise fashion as they go from inferior to superior. The anterior cruciate ligament gets its name for its attachment anterior to the intercondylar eminence of the tibia. From here it projects back to attach to the medial aspect of the lateral condyle. This fiber arrangement restricts the anterior translocation of the tibia relative to the femur. The posterior cruciate ligament projects from the posterior to the intercondylar eminence of the tibia and will attach along the lateral aspect of the medial condyle. This will prevent posterior shifting of the tibia relative to the femur. In addition, the spiraling nature of these ligaments limits internal rotation of the tibia to a certain degree. As the tibia rotates inwards, the ligaments twist together and pull the tibia and femur closer together and limit rotation to about 10 degrees. During external rotation of the tibia, these ligaments will unwind. As a result, we get a greater degree of external rotation in the flex knee position to as much as 60 degrees. Although we primarily talk about these ligaments restricting anterior and posterior shifting of the tibia, as we just discussed, in reality, there's going to be a certain level of tension within these ligaments in most joint positions. Consequently, they are particularly susceptible to injury with a variety of movements outside of normal physiological range. More on this in a little bit. The collateral ligaments will also assist in limiting the amount of rotation permitted at the knee. In a neutral extended knee position, the collateral ligaments are more or less taut, but there is a certain amount of slack, commonly referred to as crimp, that exists and permits a small amount of give during varus and valgus stresses. Now, this helps to absorb varus and valgus forces and minimizes ligament sprains. As the tibia rotates either laterally or medially, these collaterals tend to tense up to resist the rotation and assist the cruciate ligaments in limiting this sort of motion. This tension is greatest in the fully extended position. When we flex the knee, we generate slack in the collateral ligaments that needs to be taken up, resulting in a greater degree of rotation and greater dependence on the cruciate ligaments. You can observe this on yourself. Try rotating at the knee in an extended position. If you do see rotation, you'll note that most of it occurs at the hip. Now, in a sitting position with your knee bent to 90 degrees, try rotating again. You should notice a much larger degree of joint play at the knee in this position. In addition to ligamentous support, we also have the menisci within the knee. These are fibrocartilaginous discs that lay attached to the tibia. If you remember when we started talking about the knee, I talked about the incongruency between the femur and tibia. These fibrocartilaginous discs fit the contour of both. They are flat on the inferior surface to accommodate the tibia, but have a wedged shaped design, providing a curve to the superior surface to accommodate the condyles of the femur. This increases surface area contact between the menisci and the femur. Being fibrocartilaginous, there is also a certain amount of spring and elasticity which allows them to serve as shock absorbers and decrease the amount of ground reaction force between the tibia and the femur to prevent wear and tear on the hyaline cartilage surfaces of the two bones. The medial meniscus is typically described as being more of a C-shaped orientation. It is anchored medially at two spots adjacent to the intercondylar ridge within the synovial cavity, where they are bathed with synovial fluid. 
As you might expect, the lateral meniscus is located within the lateral tibiofemoral portion of the knee joint. Once again, we can see the attachment points, which are a little bit more centered within the tibial plateau region. In addition to these anchoring points, we also have what are called coronary ligaments along the periphery of both menisci that help to anchor them to the tibia. These ligaments are much more extensive in the medial meniscus, whereas the lateral meniscus tends to be a little more mobile. One final note to make on the movements at the knee. When you compare the contours of the medial and lateral femoral condyles, you'll notice subtle differences in their morphology. The medial condyle tends to be smaller and have a much more pronounced curvature. This is going to affect tracking between the femur and tibia as the knee is flexed and extended. As the knee approaches full extension, the tibia rotates laterally relative to the femur. As we previously described, this slight lateral rotation would cause twisting in the joint capsule, and particularly in the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, pulling the tibia closer to the femur and locking the knee into a fixed position. This is often referred to as the screwing home mechanism. The ability to lock out our knees plays an important role in postural standing. Locking out our knees effectively creates a rigid bridge between the femur and tibia that requires very little muscular contraction to maintain. A quick experiment you can do right now is to see how long you can stand with a slight bend in your knees so that they remain effectively straight but not locked out. It requires a lot more muscular energy to maintain the knee in a nearly extended position, resulting in fatigue after a very short period of time. This slight degree of lateral tibial rotation and full extension is significant enough that, in order to initiate knee flexion from the locked out position, the tibia must first be medially rotated to unlock the knee. This motion is initiated by the popliteus muscle, which we will discuss in the upcoming lesson on the posterior leg. Plain film radiographs are a routine part of a workup for suspected knee injuries, and knowledge of the normal anatomical features in the radiograph is critical for recognizing pathologies. Here we see three of the most common planes. In the AP view, the femur, tibia, and fibula are all clearly visible. You can see the association of the intercondylar eminence and notch, which helps to prevent shifting along the coronal plane. The contour of the femoral condyles and the tibial plateau are also apparent in this view. The patella can be seen superimposed over the distal aspect of the femur. We get a better view of the patella in the sagittal plane, as well as a different perspective on the femoral condyles. A special view known in radiology as the skyline or sunrise view, is taken from an inferior angle with the knee bent 90 degrees. This provides a relatively clear image of the patella and also gives a sense of tracking of the patella relative to the femoral condyles. MRI scans are more helpful in identifying the soft tissue components of the knee joint. Here we see two different parasagittal MRI sections at different locations through the knee. The first is more lateral and gives us an essentially an unobstructed view of the ACL running posterior superiorly. We can also observe the inferior portion of the PCL at its attachment point on the posterior aspect of the tibia, which tapers superiorly. Now note that this is not an anomaly or an indication of injury. The oblique orientation of the PCL means that it passes out of the plane of reference for this particular MRI slice. A second, more medial slice gives us an unobstructed view of the PCL between its two attachment points. Note, however, that we are now too far medial to see any indication of the ACL. The soft tissue structures we have just discussed all help to maintain proper alignment of the knee at any given joint angle. Not surprisingly then, movement past the normal physiological range of the joint, regardless of its position, will likely cause damage to these soft tissue structures. And this is what we saw in the case of Navarro Bowman, a linebacker for the 49ers. During the NFC Conference Championship game against the Seattle Seahawks on January 19, 2014, Navarro was attempting to tackle Jermaine Curse on the goal line when the ball slipped out.
As Navarro attempted to recover the fumble, Curse was tackled back into Navarro by 49er safety Eric Reed, placing a valgus stress on the knee that causes the joint to buckle on the medial aspect. And this resulted in a tear of the ACL and MCL ligaments. Isolated ACL ruptures typically occur with twisting motions with the foot planted firmly on the ground. In its championship game against the Seattle, Jermaine Curse on the goal line. As Navarro attempted to recover the fumble, Curse was tackled back into Navarro to recover the fumble. 49er safety Eric Reed, placing a valgus stress on the knee that causes the joint to buckle on the medial aspect. And this resulted in a tear of the ACL and MCL ligaments. Isolated ACL ruptures typically occur with twisting motions with the foot planted firmly on the ground, which can place incredible strain on the ligament, leading to the rupture. Patients may experience a pop followed by the rapid onset of swelling and the experience of joint instability or slipping after the initial swelling subsides. MRI imaging will show the disruption in the ACL and the sagittal plane. The condition can be treated conservatively by strengthening the surrounded musculature to help stabilize the joint, but most athletes will elect for surgical repair due to residual instability during activity. It's important to note that this instability can lead to further injury of other knee structures and ultimately osteoarthritis of the knee. Unlike an ACL rupture, an isolated meniscal tear is more likely to result from compressive forces between the femur and tibia, particularly when the limb is loaded. This creates grinding between the bone surfaces and a tendency to shear into the meniscal tissue. In isolated meniscal tears, the medial meniscus is more likely to be affected in 7 out of 10 cases. This is thought to be due to the fact that the meniscus is firmly anchored to the tibia through the coronary ligaments while the lateral meniscus is more mobile. A number of common tears have been found, many of which have been given nicknames to describe their physical appearance. With an acute meniscal tear, the patient will present with point tenderness along the tibial plateau, intercapsular swelling, and the experience of the knee catching or locking up as torn fragments get caught between the articulating surfaces. The margin of the chair is often apparent on MRI. Up to this point, we have been discussing soft tissue injuries in isolation. There are instances, however, where multiple structures may be damaged during identical events. The most commonly referenced in the medical literature involves the ACL in conjunction with the medial collateral ligament and meniscus. It's been called the unhappy or terrible triad because of the combination of the three structures involved. The most common cause of the terrible triad is mechanical trauma typically resulting in an excessive valgus force to the knee, as was seen with the Navarro-Bowman injury. The medial collateral ligament is thought to be the first structure compromised. Because of its attachment to the medial meniscus, tearing of the MCL may also result in tearing into this fibrocartilaginous pad as well. Finally, if the force is extreme enough, the ACL will be stretched beyond its strain limits and rupture. This is a devastating injury that will require surgical reconstruction of the knee. It should also be noted that traditionally we teach this condition as involving the medial meniscus for the reasons just explained. More recently, research publications have emerged in the medical literature with a contradictory view. It now appears that damage to the lateral meniscus is just as, if not more common, an injury. This is thought to be due to compressive forces between the lateral condyles, resulting in shearing of the lateral meniscus. Knee injuries have far-reaching implications in joint health long after the injury has healed or been repaired. Osteoarthritis results from the breakdown of joint cartilage and underlying bone, resulting in stiffness and pain. The condition is strongly associated with a history of mechanical trauma at the affected joint. Uneven force distribution, particularly in weight-bearing joints, leads to low-grade inflammation and degeneration of cartilage and underlying bone over time. Inappropriate bone deposition in the form of osteophytes or bone spurs exacerbate the condition. And this is thought to be an attempt by the body to remodel the joint. As the condition progresses, disfiguration and pain affect function and movement. 
Some physical therapy modalities and pain medications can provide relief in moderate conditions, with many patients electing for joint replacement in severe cases. That concludes this podcast on the knee joint. Next up, we move into the leg with a look at the posterior compartment of the leg. So until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.